This is the true story of John Ballon, 32, from Quincy. From 2012 to 2017, John was an American Navy SEAL. And he's been all over the world and fought in the war because of what happened of 9-11. He became a soldier and decided to defend his country from evil. But he wasn't always a soldier. And, in fact, he wasn't always able to defend himself and his loved ones from evil. This is his story and his true account of that incident. So, before we get into today's video, if you love the strange, dark and mysterious, then you've come to the right place because I absolutely love horror. So, before we get into it, if you find the like button's coffee and mix some poison into it, then subscribe if you haven't already and then turn on all post notifications so that way you get more dark content just like this. When John was 16 years old, he was an avid snowboarder. Starting from when he was 12, he would always go with the same two guys, his lifelong best friends, Wolf and Nick. Every winter, John, Wolf and Nick would go up to Nick's family's cabin up in the mountains of New Hampshire to go snowboarding, which they absolutely loved. So every time they'd go, it would be John, Wolf, Nick and Nick's mum and dad. Unexpectedly, leading up to John's 16th birthday, Nick's dad passed away. They had already planned the trip to the mountains that winter. John remembers he didn't think it was appropriate to ask about the trip because Nick was very close to his dad and every time they went up to the mountains, Nick's dad was always with them. John felt like how could they still go on this trip? because not only was it a low priority thing to do, but the whole dynamics had now changed. Everything was different. But Nick called and said they're still going on the trip. So John and Wolf agreed and said, okay, let's do this. Maybe the family want to do this for therapy reasons, like a fond memory thing or a goodbye to Nick's dad. So Nick's dad died a couple of months before going to the trip to the mountains. And so grief was still there. The dynamics were so obvious it was like the elephant in the room, like the drive up there. It was John, Wolf, Nick and Nick's mum. It was so apparent that Nick's dad was not there because he was always in the car with them on the drive up. Anyway, they made the trip to the New Hampshire mountains. Now they're planning on being there for three days. The way the house was built, it was built on a slope. So a portion of the house needed to be built on stilts. Because the mountain is sloped, so the back end would be dug into the mountain and the front end of the cabin was built on stilts like a higher elevation. So as you drove up to the house, there's a wraparound porch around the house. The majority of the porch is elevated. It's on a section of the house looking down over the mountain. So if you're on the wraparound porch, your footsteps are going to echo. Everyone would hear it. Also, the porch is above ground. So as you enter the house, which opens inwards, there were sleigh bells on the inside of the door. So every time you'd open the front door, you could hear sleigh bells ringing. So as soon as you enter the cabin, the kitchen is on your right, and then on your left is the dining room. But then if you walk immediately straight, you enter the living room. And if you do a 180 turn immediately behind you, on the top is a second floor lofted area. So, just for the story's sake, let's go over that uh, location again. So, you open the front door, sleigh bells ring. On your right is the kitchen, on your left is a dining room. As you walk straight through, you come into a living room. Immediately behind you on the top, at the back, is a lofted area. And on your right, there's a corridor that leads deeper into the mountain. And that leads to just one room, which is where John, Nick and Wolf would sleep every time they came to the cabin. That room is a corner room. And if you go into it, immediately on your right, it's a bunk bed. And that's where John would sleep, on the bottom bunk. Wolf would sleep on the top. Their feet would be closest to the door. In the centre of the room, 
there was a big double bed which basically sat in the middle of the available space and that that was it that was where nick would sleep so the room was packed with three places to sleep and really not much else there was a little space in between the double bed and the bunk bed that you could walk in between but that was about it so the layout is very important you'll know why soon so the boys go out snowboarding for the whole day and they decide they're going to get an early night and wake up early and have a full day of snowboarding ahead of them because they're avid snowboarders so they go to their room so they walk down that corridor and take a left which leads to their room they decide to go to sleep early but because they're so excited they stay up late talking and playing video games so about 11 12 ish nick who's on the double bed and wolf who's on the top bunk they fall asleep john was still wide awake and john remembers one thing about this room because it's built into the mountain when you turn off all the lights and electronics it's pitch black there's no windows and it's truly pitch black that's one thing he remembers about the room how it made him feel and how quiet and dark it was so one more thing you need to know is that nick had two older brothers they were in their 30s and the family was expecting at least one of them to swing by the house over the next few days that's what nick's mum had told them and also nick had mentioned it also it was unsaid but it was fairly obvious because nick's dad had just died the older brothers were trying to fill in the void to be there i guess for the family so they were expecting at least one of them to swing by over the next day or so and stay with them john had never met the older brothers but he knew the family was close so john's lying in bed thinking how quiet it is the only light is from the digital clock a little red clock which is like a beacon in the dark and john could not fall asleep later on john said he got to a point where he started counting down the hours how much time he had left if he was to fall asleep right then and there which is always a bad sign that means you're not even close to sleeping at some point around about three in the morning he remembers the time because of the clock nick and wolf were fast asleep and john all of a sudden hears footsteps on the wraparound porch now remember this in hindsight you look back at a point in time and you think of something you should have done differently but in real time in real life your brain goes to great measures to try to persuade you that everything is okay it really takes a lot of anomalies or a lot of unfortunate series of events to stack up for your brain to say look something is wrong so that's what happened to john so he hears the footsteps on the wraparound porch and even though it's 3 a.m he thinks it's got to be one of nick's brothers arriving to be part of this getaway if he comes into the room he would just pretend to be asleep because he didn't want to talk to him because number one it's 3 a.m and number two he didn't know nick's brother so the front door opens and he hears the sleigh bells jingling and then he hears what sounds like a pot falling and hitting the floor so whoever this was they didn't shut the front door john figured so they're bringing in more stuff from the car so the footsteps come into the house and now they're getting louder and louder and they're getting closer and closer to john's room what struck john was that the footsteps on the wooden porch they sounded normal to him but now they were coming closer into the house and down the hallway the footsteps sounded wrong almost alien like like it was making a wrong sound now the footsteps are outside the bedroom door where john is just, and nick and wolf are sleeping the door is still shut and john's feet are facing the door it's pitch black apart from the red light coming from the clock and of all the things that john could think of the only thing he thought of is why didn't they close the front door never mind the footsteps never mind the sleigh bells never mind the pot falling what scared him more than anything was why didn't they close the front door if they had shut the front door he would have heard the sleigh bells ringing as it shut that seemed to him such a bad idea it's three in the morning there's animals outside it's freezing cold there's a host of things 
as to why they should have shut that front door. So all bunk beds have a space at the bottom of the bed by your feet that you can look through. So if anyone walked into the room, John would be able to see them. So because of the top bunk, John's view was partially obscured. He wasn't able to see the person's face, only half of their body up to their midsection. So the door opens and this shadow walks in. And by the way, the room was already pitch black, but John can clearly make out a black silhouette. This thing walks into the room. Its head and upper body is obscured because of the top bunk. But John said this thing's hips was so high he couldn't even see those. Where its midsection should have been, it, there wasn't a midsection, it was just its legs, which meant this thing was very tall. So John figured in proportion to a normal person, this thing, this black shadow being, was about 10 foot tall. Now they're in a space which doesn't have a 10 foot tall ceiling. So this thing walks past his feet. As soon as John saw it, this unnaturally tall black shadow, plus all the things that he just thought about and heard, mainly the door still being open and all the noise it made with the footsteps, John was frozen with terror, petrified. Straight away, John knows that this is not Nick's brother. Even if this wasn't paranormal, this was such a bad situation. Even if this was some random man that came into the house, that would be a really bad situation to be in. But what John's looking at doesn't make any sense. So it walks past the foot of the bed. Then this thing makes this stiff military right turn and slowly begins to walk down the space between the two beds, between John's, John's bed and Nick's bed. So it's walking down John's right hand and John's looking up his eyes squinted pretending to be asleep and he can see this thing in his peripheral vision John said he couldn't do anything he was truly frozen with fear all he remembers thinking is whatever happens please don't look at me that would ruin his life if this thing as so much as even looks at John he said his life would be over this was a different kind of fear. This was primal. This was old, ancient. This was fear. He was truly helpless. So it walks down the aisle next to John's bed, just two feet away from him. Then it does this quick turn again, but faces away from John. Now it's facing Nick. This thing, this unnaturally tall thing, bows down to Nick's head and sinks into Nick's bed and goes into the floor and disappears. In the movies now, when the ghost has disappeared, whoever's hiding gets out and makes a break for it. But in real life, that don't happen. John is frozen. He cannot move. He's just waiting for this thing to come back. He didn't understand what he had just seen. So John's processing in his head everything. He heard the footsteps. He heard the front door open. He heard the sleigh bells ringing. He heard the pot fall. He heard the footsteps come down the corridor. He watched this thing as it walked into the room. This thing bends down and sinks into Nick, Nick's bed. So it must be in the room. Is it under his bed? John's just waiting for this thing to just get back up. He thinks, if he gets up, this thing will grab him. So, all night, he's awake, petrified. He doesn't even go to the toilet because he's so scared. John's biggest fear was that this thing coming back and bending down into him. Whatever this thing was, John did not want it looking at him. All night, he didn't move. He just scanned the room with his eyes. So finally it's morning. He hears Nick's mum in the kitchen making coffee. Now this is when he comes out of his frozen state. He now feels it's safe to move. So he gets up and goes into the kitchen. 
Even after what John just went through, he was still very aware that Nick's mum had just lost her husband. So the thought of approaching her and talking about ghosts was something he really didn't want to do. And he had never had a paranormal experience before or after since this event. So more or less, John was a skeptic. So the thought of him talking to Nick's mum about ghosts was ludicrous and unsensitive. Also, it's like 6 a.m. in the morning. She's just lost her husband. It really felt inappropriate. So he remembers really struggling with this, how to communicate with what happened. Side note, I'm as sensitive as the next guy, but if that happened to me, I would have already been packed and dressed and I'd been out of the door. But I guess everyone's different. So he sits down to eat breakfast and she picks up that something is wrong. She's sizing him up and John says, did any of your two sons come by last night? So Nick's mum says no. So John's sitting there and his face must have given something away because all of a sudden she says, I heard my husband too. At that point, John said that made him feel much, much worse because on one hand, she's confirming something that he wished was only a bad dream. And number two, she thinks that that thing was her husband walking into the house, just watching over everyone. So he didn't know what to do. He was done with this conversation. Now this is night one. There's still two more nights of this and it gets worse. So Nick and Wolf eventually wake up and come sit down. So the same way John felt about talking to Nick's mum, he felt the same way about talking to Nick. It was inappropriate and unsensitive. His dad had just died, but Wolf, he wasn't a family member. He was John's friend. So John takes him aside and tells him what went on, but kept it casual. He said he could have sworn he heard someone in the house last night. But Wolf was like, mm, you know you was probably dreaming. That's what it is. But John said he wasn't dreaming. In fact, he hadn't slept at all. But he had no proof and couldn't make any sense of this. Nick overheard the conversation and then said to him, what's wrong? John said, after we get back from snowboarding tonight, can you two wait till I go to sleep first? Then after I'm asleep, then you guys can fall asleep. So Nick and Wolf say, yeah, okay, weirdo, whatever. So John's big plan was to go to bed really, really early. He didn't sleep the night before, so he figured he will sleep really early. Big mistake. So they go out, they spend the whole day snowboarding and everything's fine. Eventually, John convinces himself that that didn't happen. It was broad daylight, he was having fun, he was with his mates, so all the thoughts of fear were gone. And he's thinking to himself, it must have been some kind of sleep paralysis. Even though John had never had sleep paralysis, he thought this is a weird situation, so it must have had some kind of explanation. So. Turns out, it didn't. So he gets back from snowboarding and John immediately gets into bed. It's like six o'clock in the evening, so it's very early. And John says, I'm going to bed. So he gets into bed and all he can think about is the night before. He cannot sleep. So hours go by, eventually Nick and Wolf come into the room and they're lying there and they're trying their best to stay awake. So that now John can fall asleep first. So it's getting later and later and now John's back to that same situation. He's counting down the hours in his head and he's thinking now, if I go to sleep now, how many hours will I have left? The guys eventually say, look, I'm tired, we're going to sleep. So they both fall asleep and John's left there awake. John remembers being so upset with himself. Why didn't he just wait and fall asleep with the rest of them? He felt like such an idiot. The only thing that made this whole thing real, looking back, is John remembers he put a knife on the top of the bunk, right on top of him, underneath the springs. So he's lying in bed, looking at the digital clock in the dark, and it's about the same time that horrible thing happened. But maybe today it wouldn't happen. Maybe it was a one-off, right? Wrong. 
John's heart sunk. You know that feeling you get when your insides drop, when you get bad news, or of impending doom when you know is about to happen? Well, he got all of that when he heard the footsteps on the wraparound porch again. They sounded exactly the same, and he knew what was happening, and he knew it wasn't Nick's brothers. He hears the sleigh bells ringing. He hears that bloody pot falling again. In every sense, it's a deja vu. The exact same thing starts happening. The footsteps walk into the house and again, referencing movies, the character now would place himself in a position with a knife and defend himself. But in real life, John's thinking that this thing is gonna be in my room any second. It happened yesterday. It's obviously happening again. For the love of God, don't bow down into me. The way it bowed down into Nick's bed. Just don't look at me. Anything else, just do not look at me. That would ruin his life. If some entity just engages with him, just looks at him, that would ruin his life. At this point now in the story, John is visually upset. He's recounting what happened all those years ago. This thing walks down the hall. He's hearing the footsteps. He's looking at the wall, gauging where it is on the other side. Now forget the paranormal thing for a minute. Let's just say it's a stranger in the middle of the night. He walks into your home. That is a horrible thing. The footsteps come right outside the door and he's lying in bed, looking at his knife that's under the springs on top. And he's petrified. He can't move, he's frozen, he's drenched in sweat. And just a few seconds it's taken for this thing to walk from the front door to outside his bedroom. He knows what's about to happen. It's happening again, he's not crazy. Like what the fuck is this thing? He's petrified, he can't reach for the knife. He's so worried that he'll make a sound and he'll alert this thing that he's there. And he remembers that he could only move his eyes and he was so scared he remembered thinking he shouldn't even move his eyes that much in case that thing heard that. This was primal fear. So he opens the door and John is lying, looking up, hands by his side. This thing walks past the bottom of the bed then does that military turn right then walks slowly down the aisle between John and Nick's bed. He remembers the night before this thing folded into Nick's bed and disappeared. And John's thinking, please, don't bow into me. Whatever happens, just don't do that. So it does the exact same thing it did the night before. It turned and faced Nick. It bowed down into Nick's bed, then disappeared into the floor. Again, in the movies, they, port they portray it like as soon as the ghost has gone, the guy who's hiding gets up and raises the alarm but back in real life John is thinking it's gonna come back this is night two it's happened again it's waiting for him in this under his bed it's gonna come up through the bed so many questions filled him all night again he lied there without sleeping until he heard Nick's mum and it was such a relief now at this point he didn't give a shit about being polite. He wasn't going to go out there and distance himself from the conversation. He was going to get straight to the point. He was going to go straight up to her and say, look, what the fuck is wrong with your house? He tells her everything. And in acute detail, as much as he can. And he's, as he's doing this, her reaction didn't match up. It wasn't a reaction as surprise, terror or confusion. No, instead it was empathy. She felt sympathetic. She felt bad for him. She didn't understand how he felt. He told her everything and he felt she was just not getting it. Then she says, John, I told you yesterday. And again, I heard him last night. It was my husband. I heard him last night too. You got nothing to worry about. John was like, no, 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 no. That thing cannot be what I'm seeing. She says, yes, I heard him. He opened the front door. 
I heard the pot fall. I heard him walk through the house. I'm assuming he came into Nick's room with you guys. John is totally freaked out at that point. He's like, what is happening? At this point now, John was crying. His young mind was starting to break. He hadn't slept for two days. He had been subjected to terror. So John said at that point, he needed his mum. He felt so helpless. No disrespect to Nick's mum, but he felt like he was talking to a fucking lunatic. But at the same time, he's recalling it. She's recalling exactly the same thing that John's saying. He needed to leave. He needed to get out of that house. He can't be here anymore. Then it dawned on him. How can he make that happen? Nick's mum, Wolf and Nick, they're not leaving today. And it was pretty clear that Nick's mum liked the fact that she thought her husband was walking around the cabin every night. So she's not in any rush. There's still one more night that they're gonna have to be here. And then he'd have to tell his mum and dad to drive up all the way to New Hampshire to come and get him. Why? Because he's seen ghosts. This is a trip John loved. He looked forward to this trip every year. It wouldn't have made any sense to them. They would have been like, what's wrong with you? And honestly, he wasn't prepared to have that kind of conversation with his mum and dad. He wasn't about to say, oh yeah, by the way, let me tell you about the ghosts in the house. So he resigned to the fact that he had to stay one more night. In retrospect, he said he should have called his parents. That's what parents are for. Just get the hell up here. It doesn't matter why, just come and get me. But he didn't. And it was such a confusing time for him. The situation, he didn't have a blueprint for this. How to handle it. The thoughts, the things that were happening. And he was so young, so he stayed. Nick and Wolf get up and John makes the decision he's going to stay. Nick's mum is reassuring him, telling him her husband is in the house, just protecting them. Nick and Wolf come into the room and Wolf is pretty much like he knows something is wrong. It's written all over John's face because he's been crying and John tells them everything. Nick was always reserved, so he couldn't tell what Nick was feeling, but Wolf knew something was up. And out of the two, Wolf would be the one to believe that John was seeing something. Whether he believed it was paranormal or not, I don't know. But the fact that as, as John was telling them what had happened, Nick's mum was reinforcing everything, saying, yep. She says, yeah, I heard him too. I heard the door open. I was upstairs. I heard him walking through the front door. I heard him knock over the pot. And Wolf is like, what the fuck is going on? Nick was quiet. He probably was uncomfortable. It, this was about his dad. I don't think he wanted to believe what John was telling him. Before they went snowboarding for the day, because Nick's mum would drive them and collect them, she took them to the local store. They bought a coffee table to replace the one in the house. So as you walk into the living room, straight ahead, on the left was some stairs and at the bottom of the stairs was a coffee table which they kept a landline on it. The cabin's in the middle of nowhere, they needed a phone. So they kept that on the table. But the table was either broken or was old and it needed a new one. So after snowboarding, Nick, Wolf and John unloaded this table and they brought it in and put it in its place. That night, they go to bed. John was ruthless in trying to keep them awake. He wasn't in any mood to mess around, so every few minutes he'd kick the bottom of the bunk from underneath. He'd shake Nick. He was doing everything in his power to keep them awake. He was absolutely shitting it. He was terrified. And to add to the final nail in the coffin, during the day they found out that none of the brothers would be making the trip. They are not coming, so no one should be in the house apart from them. So. After all his attempts to keep Nick and Wolf awake, they fall asleep. Everyone's asleep, it's pitch black and silent. And around 2, 3 in the morning, he hears it again. The footsteps. The door 
the sleigh bells, the pot, the footsteps, the walking in. Now this is the third night. So he was expecting this. He was expecting for it to come in, walk past him, and to bow down into Nick's bed and then disappear. So everything was the same, but instead of walking towards the bedroom, it walked straight into the living room. So where this thing was, if John sat up and looked straight behind the wall, was the living room. This thing would be there. So he's waiting for this thing to walk through the wall. But after a few minutes, he hears this thing walking upstairs. He's listening to the creaks of the steps as it's going upstairs. The sounds made John's skin goose up. It walks upstairs and now it's in the room above John. If the last two nights were an example, this thing sinks into the ground. Two nights in a row now, it's sunk into the ground. Only this time it's above John's room. So John's literally imagining that this thing sinking into the ground and it's going to sink right into his bunk bed from the ceiling. So it's above his room and the sounds stop. Nick's mum is upstairs. So John's got his stupid knife and he's just waiting. Hours and hours and hours go by. And he's just waiting for his, for his worst nightmare to literally come in through the ceiling. This entity to go into him. Even if it was to come down on top of Nick again. And he'd see it from his peripheral vision. That was terrifying. The thoughts didn't make sense, but they were happening. So all night he's waiting and waiting. Now for three days now, he's had no sleep, but at some point in that night, he must have fallen asleep out of sheer exhaustion. Some point in the morning now, he hears Nick's mum. So it's in the morning, he's leaving, today he's up. So Nick's mum is standing there by the stairs and she's standing there near the coffee table, crying. So she signals to John to come over here. She points at the coffee table. So she gets down on her knees and she's crying. Scratched into the coffee table are three words, I love you. John was done. That was it. That ended his friendships. It certainly ended it with Nick, but with Wolf to a lesser degree. He stopped snowboarding completely. He never went back to the cabin. Wolf did, but John couldn't. John believes to this day that that thing wasn't Nick's dad, but something else. It was only pretending to be Nick's dad. It's the only time John had ever had a paranormal experience. Well, there you have it guys. Let me know what you think about the story. What would you have done if you was in John's position? Did you think it was Nick's dad? Or do you think it was some kind of demon taking advantage of Nick's mum's grief? So if you're a fan of the strange, dark and mysterious, then you've come to the right place because that's what I love and that's what I do. So I'm gonna try and post two to three times a week. So if you like that type of content, then I'm asking you to find the like buttons coffee and mix some poison into it. Then if you haven't already, subscribe and turn on all po post notifications so you'll be notified when I upload. Till next time, peace. She takes me down.